These were the people everyone wanted to be. Posters on every bedroom wall across the country, and the decade was a great time to grow up. Well, for most people, but for child stars, not so much. Oh, I already know all that stuff. Extremely long hours of work, the unbearable scrutiny of being in the limelight 24 seven, robbed these kids of a normal childhood. And while some were able to cope with their immense fame, many others were not and led far from happy lives. And what made her wish people forgot her biggest role? Child stars, prison bars. I am your host, Nostalgic Nick, here with all these answers and more. If you enjoy our deep dive, give this video a thumbs up, it really helps. And subscribe to our channel so you never miss a memory. So let's find out a little more about the kids we all wanted to know. Is Tony Moran related to Aaron Moran? Everybody gets their start somewhere, and Aaron's entry into showbiz sounds like something out of a fairy tale. She was one of six kids, so it's easy to get lost in the crowd, and neither parent was in the industry. But ever since she was a tiny gal, Erin showed an interest in acting, and her mom supported this passion by signing her onto a talent agency. It's thanks to Erin's generation that the Moran family is famous. Besides Erin, her brothers followed her lead into acting, John and Tony Moran. You may recall a four-year-old John on Happy Days in 1974. As Myron, he shot the Fonz in the face with a squirt gun. So what I say goes, dig it. <laughs> And Tony, you may recall, from some guest appearances on The Waltons and Chips. But peel back that mask and feel the chill down your spine, because Tony is the unmasked Michael Myers in 1978's Halloween. Growing up, Erin actually knew Anson Williams since she was 12. And it's Anson who revealed Erin never really left the bad part of her Cinderella story, growing up in a broken home. <laughs> In fact, he called it a really harsh upbringing and said, quote, No child should have the family she had. She didn't get the upbringing a child should have, which really makes life hard. She had a lot of problems for a lot of years. That's as much as he was emotionally able to speak about it. And terribly, this would have an effect on the rest of Aaron's life to the very end. Did Aaron Moran sing on Happy Days? Joni was the quintessential 50s all-American girl. Fun, wide-eyed, beautiful, sweet, but could definitely hold her own when it counted. It just so happened Erin was the full package too, balancing her Happy Days work with additional appearances on The Love Boat, Hollywood Squares, Galaxy of Terror, and more. But the gig that really let her show off her range was a 1975 episode of The Waltons called The Song. She played Sally Ann Harper, a love interest for Ben and Jason, and Erin brought very real musical talent to the show. That's her really singing. To make my feelings clear and tell you that I love you. Showing off a voice so angelic, it's no wonder the brothers were smitten. Erin also got to flex her musical Moran muscles in Happy Days opposite Scott Bayo as Chachi, when Chachi and Joni sing the duet. Once again, Erin showing off she can really sing. You came to me, not took me by surprise. And she clearly stood out, even opposite a guy who would land his own record deal. Impressive to say the least. Did Erin Moran ever get married? As long as Erin was a child, teen, or even young adult, she was forever associated with Joni. I feel grown up. But nobody treats me like one. And after that slew of early TV work, the jobs began to dry up. So Erin had some time for romance, even twice. First, she married Rocky Ferguson in 1987, but the true love came in 1993, when she tied the knot with a partner for life, Stephen Fleischman. They actually wed the same year she got divorced from Ferguson. They moved to California before moving to Indiana to be with Stephen's sick mom. But between being caretakers, they were also apparently party animals, where reportedly they were kicked out of a trailer park for causing too much of a ruckus. 
How much did Aaron Moran make on Happy Days? Joni Cunningham was a role that defined Aaron Moran in not one but two programs. Happy Days became a money printing machine thanks to merchandising and spin-off shows like Laverne and Shirley and Mork and Mindy. But the life of an actor isn't always as lucrative as you may think, or at least not as lucrative as some would hope. That's why Aaron Moran, Anson Williams, Marion Ross, and Don Most joined forces against the parent company in a now infamous lawsuit. These cast members said they were not getting paid the merchandising profits that were owed to them in their contracts. You know, things like comic books, lunch boxes, dolls, magnets, t-shirts, and so much more. Hey. <laughs> The lawsuit was Marion's idea after a friend of hers told her about a themed slot machine game that announced jackpot if the player got her character five times. The way the formula worked is the actors would get 5% if their own solo image was used and 2.5% if they were in a group. CBS said they were owed between 8,500 to 9,000 each while the cast was calling for millions. Two people notably absent from this crazy back and forth were the famed Henry Winkler and Ron Howard. Their attorney reasoned Winkler had so many merchandising opportunities that he was properly financially compensated. <laughs> While Ron was a famous director and could probably afford to forget if the network missed a few paychecks. As for the others, this was just a hint at the problems plaguing Aaron, who never really latched on to fame outside of Joni Cunningham. Initially, a judge rejected the cast's demands, but by 2012, it was reported that the actors would get an unspecified amount of money. The only hints we have come from Anson, who said he was very satisfied with the settlement. What happened to Aaron Moran after Happy Days? Happy Days was a kind of underdog story. It had a bumpy start, and when ratings dipped, that looked like the very end. But it got a total makeover and came back stronger than ever, with a new emphasis on other characters, like Joni and Chachi. In fact, their love story became so iconic, they got their own spinoff, aptly titled Joni Loves Chachi. But no amount of jumping the shark could save Happy Days or Joni Loves Chachi. Well, I don't care what they think. I'm going to make my own money and do what I want when I want to do it. Part of the issue was culture clash, with America coming into a rougher cut image of itself and saying goodbye to the clean, cutesy stuff. Throw in the fact that the show had been going on for over 200 episodes, that's a long time to keep the momentum up. Sadly for Erin, this also stalled out her own career momentum. Everything after Happy Days was just bit parts. And after a while, in the 90s, even those dried up. So, with significantly less work came financial issues. It was reported that Erin and her husband lost their California home to foreclosure. There was even a time she called the Holiday Inn Express home because money was tight. Aaron would frequent an Indiana bar enough for the bartender to hear Aaron's mantra that she, quote, lost all her money. After some vodka, she went from easygoing to bad enough to get kicked out many times. And when she didn't misbehave, she arrived at one in the afternoon, stayed for a while, and then put in a to-go order. The bartender says she always came alone, but the only person she'd talk about was her husband. Otherwise, she said no one cared about her. How did Aaron Moran pass away? On top of a dried up career and ongoing battle with depression, Aaron Moran was hit with cancer. It was 2017, just a bit after celebrating her wedding anniversary, that Moran woke up to blood on her pillow. They thought maybe she bit her tongue while sleeping, but it kept happening. Finally, Moran was tested and it turned out to be throat cancer, which hit her very hard and very fast and left her unable to eat, drink, or even speak. She had to use a feeding tube and her husband fed her six to eight times a day. This left Moran even more isolated than before, except for one other bright spot in her life. 
Her Happy Days co-star and early friend Anson Williams kept in regular contact with her. Since she couldn't speak, the two texted often. Her diagnosis was brutal to get, since Anson felt she'd been turning her life around. Some facilities attempted to treat her, but none were successful, and they also kept quiet just how badly the cancer had metastasized. By April of 2017, she was struggling to breathe, and while Erin was watching TV in bed, her husband Stephen lay down next to her. He held her hand before he fell asleep and they were still holding hands when he woke up an hour later. He turned to Erin, his wife, only to find that she was gone. When Anson, who had been hopeful about his co-star, heard the news, all he could do was weep. A reaction more than a few of us can relate to. Hearing the sad ending to TV's most beloved all-American girl, Erin Moran. How old was Jack Wilde in Oliver? You couldn't have picked a better kid whose life paralleled his breakthrough film. Jack Wilde had a very humble upbringing. His parents had very meager incomes, and when Jack was just eight, he took up a job helping the milkman, even if it only brought him in a whopping five shillings, which in those days was the equivalent of around a dozen or so pennies. Life as a star wasn't remotely on Jack's radar even when that's exactly the kind of rags to riches track that would turn his life around. In fact, Jack outright admitted, quote, I never wanted to be an actor. I saw myself as either a footballer or a doctor. I don't care what you see. So he focused on sports and played football or soccer for us Americans. He played with his brother and another kid who wasn't at all good at sports. That other kid was Phil Collins, and his mom worked as a theater agent. One day, she came to the park to pick Phil up, and she spotted the Wild Boys and talked to them, asked if they ever thought about acting. Well, she enrolled them in drama school, and that was that. And by 1964, Jack was cast in Oliver, first the West End version as Charlie. His brother got the lead role, but jump ahead just four years later, Jack was 16 and he was singing his way into our hearts as the Artful Dodger. Did Jack Wilde sing in Oliver? 1968's Oliver won the Academy Award for Best Score of a Musical Picture and Best Sound, and it was nominated several times over by other film boards, mostly highlighting the music and Jack Wilde as a promising newcomer. A huge part of the movie's success was Jack's undeniable and versatile talent. It just so happens music was a familiar companion for Jack. For one thing, Jack did all of his own singing. And another surprise connection to music. While Jack did not play Artful Dodger in the West End production, that role went to David Jones, who would later be part of The Monkees. Rivaling Wilde's beloved film and TV career is his musical work. By 1970, this new coming rising star had his own album, fittingly called the Jack Wilde Album, mostly made up of Jack's covers of popular British tracks. We got to hear some original stuff the following year with Everybody's Coming Up Roses. My personal favorite is Bring Yourself Back to Me. Then in 72 came the last big album, A Beautiful World, and the great single Some Beautiful stands out for charting in both the US and the UK. Were Mark Lester and Jack Wilde friends? Of course, one of the driving forces for Oliver is the friendship between our titular character and the most artful Dodger. Jack still became the apple of everyone's eyes, even when not playing the title role, as bringing Oliver to life was Mark Lester. We've seen enough drama to know full-grown adults can get pretty petty when they don't get the screen time they want. So what about these teens? Or, you know, being fortunate enough to be able to play the part of the artful dog. Well, actually, life ended up imitating art here, and both Jack and Mark were fast friends, just like their on-screen counterparts. And not long after Oliver, the two reunited for 1971's Melody. Though they each did their own things, their brotherhood was so strong and left such an impression that Mark would say decades later, quote, Jack was like a brother to me during the making of the film and was always very protective. He added, quote, the chemistry between us was just something very, very special and lasted throughout our lives. 
How did Oliver Reed get the scars on his face? Not everything was smooth sailing, even working on the film that made Jack a household name. In fact, working on Oliver, all the child actors were scared of their adult colleague, Oliver Reed. A lot of repeating names here, I'm sorry. But in the film, Reed played the big bad Bill Sykes. Well, that makes sense because they're all scared of him. But it was more about Reed's sheer giant presence than his character's actions. I want some more. What? Jack remembered, quote, As kids, we were all terrified of him because he was this giant of a man. And the only time we ever saw him was when he was in costume and made up for the part. As a talented and dedicated character actor, Reed kept his distance from the younger cast, hoping to maximize his imposing effects. The kids never got to know him as anything but a looming, imposing figure. Tragically, there was another issue weighing heavy on Reed's mind. Just a few years ago, he'd been hit at a bar when he got into an argument with some other patrons. He left with a dismissive comment, but when he went to the bathroom, the guys ambushed him, smacking him with broken bottles, and the result was three dozen stitches. Reed was left with scars across his face that he thought surely meant the end of his acting career. Who did Jack Wilde marry? So Jack never intended on being an actor, but that life path brought him some pretty big milestones. For one thing, he was just 12 when he met a Welsh actress named Gaynor Jones in drama school. The two did not cross paths again until 1970, and six years later, they were married. Sadly, however, they did split up in 1985 because of Jack's personal demons. But Jack found lifelong love with another woman named Claire Harding who he met while they worked together in Jack and the Beanstalk. The two were married in 2005, but the fairy tale was always in danger of drawing to a very dramatic and tragic close. What happened to Jack Wilde after Oliver? After rocketing to fame with Oliver, Jack further cemented his celebrity status by landing the role of Jimmy in H.R. Puffinstuff, a role he reprised in the 1970 movie and Puffin Stuff is legendary. But that same decade, he was classified a teen heartthrob among the ranks of Barry Williams and David Cassidy. Of course, he was featured in Tiger Beat. Actually, former Tiger Beat editor Ann Moses says Jack was one of the first of the magazine stars she approached. She just couldn't help but see him as a child at 17, chaperoned by his big bro. And as she tells it, his time in the industry was like a shooting star, magnificent, but very brief, before flickering out and leaving us all sadder for it. Jack did have one ongoing grievance. Even in his 20s, he was landing gigs playing young teens. He said, quote, when I first entered in the show business, of course, I didn't mind playing younger roles. However, it did bug me when I would be 21 being offered the role of a 13 year old. I'm not saying I didn't enjoy playing these roles. I had barrels of fun. I just wanted more serious and dramatic roles. It's that simple. He might have gotten the chance since there were plans for him to star opposite Susie Quattro from Happy Days in a British rendition of Bonnie and Clyde. But this very promising project never saw the light of day. And I'm sure that had to be a very painful blow. Jack took a break from acting and focused on music. But when he returned to the industry, most of his roles were much smaller. And in this time, in his early 20s, Jack became an alcoholic. He drained his funds to fuel his addictions, and it got to the point he had to move in with his dad. He couldn't afford housing. Jack's alcoholism seeped into every aspect of his life. It ruined his marriage with his first wife. And it got so bad, he had three cardiac arrests and had to be hospitalized multiple times. By the mid 80s, Jack downed three to four bottles of vodka a week. Every single day, he would go through half a bottle of vodka plus two bottles of wine. And my head's even spinning thinking about that. Chronic alcoholism can lead to diabetes and that's just what happened to Jack. For a blip of time, he was sober thanks to a drying out clinic run by musician Pete Townshend. But he drank a bottle of champagne in celebration and ended up at square one. It was only with the support from Alcoholics Victorious that Jack got permanently sober in 1989. For years, Jack and his second wife Claire worked tirelessly on his autobiography to tell the full scope of his very unique tale. But tragically, this would be a task Claire would have to finish alone. 
Although Jack accomplished his admirable task of getting sober, the damage to his health had already been done, and in 2000, Jack was diagnosed with oral cancer. Jack blames this on his drinking, but he doesn't want to blame his drinking on his child star history. The way he saw it, quote, I believed I'd have been a heavy drinker in any case. And this may be true, his brother was also hospitalized for drinking too much. So Jack and Claire moved to a quiet village in Britain, and Jack underwent a bunch of procedures to battle his cancer, including chemotherapy and radiotherapy. For a brief time, the cancer went into remission, and it looked like Jack was in the clear. But then it came back in full force. To try to save Jack's life, he had his voice box and tongue surgically removed. Jack Wilde, who charmed nations with his voice, was now left unable to speak, eat, or drink, and had to be fed through a tube in his stomach. That was how Jack spent his final days before passing away on March 1st, 2006 at the age of 53. His wife, Claire, survives him and was left with the imposing task of finishing his biography, combing through his personal archives, audio interviews, and written recollections. But she did finish the task, and his autobiography was released in 2016. The title is It's a Dodger's Life. Jack Wilde really was exceptional. He never accounted for the legendary status he ended up earning, crossing paths with other triumphant and troubled souls, figuring out their place while he figured out his. It was almost the perfect rags to riches story, but it turned tragic at the end. Pieces aligning but still surprising. Eve Plum was born for the spotlight in the spotlight. Her father was a recording company executive and her mother a dancer. Growing up in Burbank, she was at the doorstep of Hollywood already, but first she had one obstacle to overcome. How to stand out. I know, I know, it's almost like foreshadowing. Eve had three other siblings all competing for attention. Lucky for her, fortune came knocking on her door. Okay, it was actually down the street. You see, when Eve was young, a talent agent moved in right next door. The agent specialized in representing child actors. Thanks to this support, the first audition Eve went to, she nailed. So began her career mostly with commercials, then shows aplenty. And besides the Brady Bunch, I know you've seen her in a lot of other favorites. She was in Lassie, The Big Valley, Family Affair, and even Gunsmoke. You're not supposed to cheat. A quick fun fact, the dress Eve wore for Gunsmoke had previously been worn by the one and only Shirley Temple. Already a family business. So no one actually planned the acting life for Eve, but once it was clear this was her career, her family of course jumped right on board to help out. And we've all heard some real horror stories about child stars and the parents controlling them. Well, thankfully, Eve had the opposite of that. Eve's father managed her money, but she's made it clear he invested it wisely and no one stole anything from her. As for her mom, she was with her on set each day, but just played the protector role not serving as a tyrant like the ones we saw on the Mickey Mouse Club video. You gotta check that one out for some meddling parents. Middle Child Syndrome They say the best stories are real ones, and life can be stranger than fiction. Turns out that was true enough for the Brady Bunch creators. There's some truth behind the fictional Bradys. You see, Eve stood out among her peers thanks to her experience and industry background. Barry, Maureen, even Susan came to the Brady Bunch with some experience under their belt. But producer Lloyd J. Schwartz noticed something different from Eve. She was always a bit apart from everything and everyone else, and the show writers picked up on that. Eve's recruitment is often chalked up to her resemblance to the first Mrs. Brady, Joyce Boulafont. And we did discuss how appearances influenced casting in our Brady Bunch Secrets video. But Eve was the lookalike chosen because execs knew she could hold her own. She wasn't just a cute face. But this loneliness was incorporated into the show, and it translated into her middle child syndrome. Ironically, that storyline of being trapped, invisible in the middle, ended up being one of the most iconic symbols of the Brady Bunch. Now, now, say it with me. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha! The Boozy Bunch. 
Thanks to Maureen's memoir, Here's the Story, we've got some juicy details from behind the scenes at the Brady house. Exactly the stuff you'd write in your diary so the folks don't find out. One common complaint among the actors was how their characters never got more mature. McCormick wanted to see Jan staying out way past curfew, and Marsha hiding a boyfriend in the bedroom, that kind of stuff. So, to quietly rebel, Eve and Maureen would film scenes without wearing bras, and the two sisters got into plenty of their own mischief. Eve and Maureen became close friends and hung outside of work too. They even went on a cruise together. While out on the open seas, they drank rum and cokes, had themselves some wine, and it got to the point that Maureen dubbed them the Boozy Bunch. But beyond this teenage rebellion, Plum did relatively well staying away from addictive substances, especially compared to McCormick, who would develop a cocaine addiction, and Mike fell into alcoholism. Love Triangle is in the air. Living the life of a star is sure to fill your head with dreams of romance. Thankfully, no one was actually related to each other, so Christopher Knight was free to have a crush on Susan Olsen, and then Eve Plum once everyone started growing up. Eventually, Chris took Eve to his pickup truck that was equipped with candles, some drinks, and blankets. The two had a romantic night under the stars until some cops crashed the party. Eve got roped into some other romance plots thanks to her crush on night. During a London cruise, Barry concocted a master plan to bond with Maureen. Boys roomed with each other, the girls were together, but Barry figured out he could get Eve over to their room to spend time with Knight, giving him the chance to be with Maureen alone in the other room. Eve wasn't destined to meet her soulmate through work. In fact, she was the first of her TV siblings to marry in 1979, but less than two years later the couple split. Not to worry too much, in 1995 she tied the knot with a tech consultant, and they have been together ever since. They're still a family of two with no plans to grow because parenthood never spoke to Eve. She discussed having kids because people want to versus feeling like they should, and she said if she was going to, she would have adopted. Big change of pace. If you look at Eve's resume, everything with the name Brady in it has her in a main role, of course. But everything else was usually one episode gigs, and her film career was even more sparse. Plum usually shrugged this off, saying, quote, Things go in cycles. You have down times, up times, busy times, not so busy times. But she was always seen as Jan Brady. But that changed pretty drastically with her next big role. The 1976 TV movie Dawn, Portrait of a Teenage Runaway, in which she played a teen prostitute. I told you, I'm 18. I don't care if you're 45. Eve Plum loved the change of pace, saying, quote, I think playing a hooker was fun, but it did get awkward when she went costume shopping with her mom. Regrets, regrets, regrets. The Brady Bunch rocketed Eve to new heights, but the thing is, she had already proven herself and had important work beforehand. So when she gave a knockout performance in Portrait, everyone was shocked and acted like this display of skill came out of nowhere. It got to the point she told reporters, quote, Don't forget, I've been acting since I was six years old and I've lived in Hollywood most of my life. Her complicated relationship with Jan became obvious to everyone, to the point that Christopher Knight would say Eve had the hardest time of all coming back to the role. That's why we don't see her in the Brady Bunch Variety Hour, which would have required a five-year contract. Eve has spoken about the weird place she found herself in, saying, quote, We all grow up, but not everyone wants us after we do. Further saying, I'll always be Jan Brady to so many people. I can't escape it, but I can do other things. Eve likened returning to Jan as taking one for the team. Eve says she doesn't outright regret this career-defining role per se, but she has admitted, quote, Sometimes I wish it would go away, yes. You know, sometimes I wish people would just see me as I am and, you know, forget about that. Life imitates art imitates life. Jan tried to find some unique trait that helped her stand out from the beautiful older Marsha and adorable young Cindy. Eve found a way to totally stand out against her Jan-defined background through art. When she settled in California now as an adult, 
she joined a local design review board and showed off her painting skills. And some of her pieces are hanging in some big shot studios. Her favorite subject matter is still life paintings, a hobby she picked up to entertain her between jobs. And that artistic eye has translated into home decor and design. You know what that made her perfect for? The Brady House. The Brady House. HGTV's A Very Brady Renovation. But this time, she returned to the Brady Bunch happily, since it also involved such a big dream of hers. In fact, it was nearly therapeutic. During the renovation, the weirdest thing for her was walking around that set, this time with all the right walls and ceilings. Jan put her talents to use by recreating a bunch of artwork from the show to hang in the renovated abode, really making it all the more special. And if you want some Eve Plum merch of your own, she sells some paintings and a bunch of handmade mugs, her latest crafting project. But what you won't see her selling anytime soon, the storage units full of Brady Bunch themed goods. She's kept them all these years, all these complicated years. Was there a real Nellie Olson? Little House on the Prairie changed the landscape of television and delved into some very mature, glossed over themes. You might not have caught them all, like addiction, poverty, faith, prejudice, and even assault. It tackled real topics and had very real roots. And of course, some of you have read the books that started it all. The Little House series by the real Laura Ingalls Wilder. The books beautifully paved the way for this nine-season television titan, but it wasn't a one-to-one -one adaptation. Michael Landon compared the novels to cookbooks, so a lot of drama had to be added. Nellie Olson appeared in three Little House books, but it was enough to give the show's writers something to work with. And while plenty of characters existed in real life, Nellie was not one of them. Instead, she's more of a mashup of three different people in Laura's life. Nellie Owens, Estella Gilbert, and Genevieve Masters. Nellie Owens made such a negative impression on Ingalls Wilder that she didn't dare use the same name in her books. Yup, that's some deep-seated fear from childhood. Did Alison Arngrim wear a wig on Little House? I won't take it back because it's true. What's it like to be one of the most hated characters in fiction? Was it a role with a reception Allison thought was worth keeping? Well, it came with quite a few ups and downs. First, the costuming. The head of curly golden locks was indeed a wig. As Allison puts it, quote, There was no point at which it felt comfortable. The stylist had to pin parts of the curly wigs to her head, but warning if you just ate, they would pin them so tight that Allison's scalp would bleed on multiple occasions. Ouch. Then there's the top layers of clothing that all the women had to wear, making for a very uncomfortable experience. Which maybe made her job easy, I guess. Early on in the audition process, Allison knew this girl was a piece of work. In fact, when she was asked to read for Nellie, she told her dad, quote, this is not a normal part. This girl is, well, she's the B word. Her father told her to just read the material with that in mind. And looking back, Allison thinks it says something about her that she did so well to earn the part. That playing Nellie confirmed her suspicions and she described it as, quote, like having PMS for seven years. She did her job so well, but any actor who plays a baddie inevitably gets a lot of haters, and boy did she get haters. In fact, one viewer despised Nellie so much, they physically confronted Allison when she was only 16, while at the Hollywood Christmas Parade. That's not in the spirit. Suddenly, an onlooker rushed forward and threw a cup of orange soda right at her head. Wow, playing nasty Nellie really could be a thankless job. Are Melissa Gilbert and Alison Arngrim still friends? Laura smells like a dirty horse. Laura smells. Tom and Jerry, Al Bundy and neighbor Marcy, Half Pint and Nasty Nelly. TV is chock full of iconic rivalries, and Alison and Melissa were primed to be enemies from the start. That's because Allison actually auditioned for two other roles, neither of them Nellie. Her top pick was Laura Ingalls, but series lead and co-creator Michael Landon saw her better suited as the primary antagonist, basically boxing her out of any chance for that leading lady praise the others got. Allison channeled some of Nellie's spirit on set, remember when all the younger characters grew into having love interests, 
Melissa Gilbert and Dean Butler didn't quite have the chemistry showrunners wanted to see and pointed to Allison and Steve Tracy as a primary example. Gilbert was squeamish around PDA, and armed with this knowledge, Allison made it her mission to make romantic scenes with Steve as gushy, over-the-top, and all-around uncomfortable as possible, just to tease Gilbert. But here's the twist. Allison and Melissa were actually great friends. There was zero animosity between the actors. Not for Gilbert getting the role that Allison wanted, not for competing screen time, nothing. Looking back, Allison said, quote, it's funny, I think if you play enemies on set, you end up becoming friends. We hit it off right away. We had slumber parties, visit each other's houses on weekends. People couldn't believe it. And as recently as 2021, Melissa went onto social media and called Allison, quote, one of my very dearest friends and very favorite on-screen partners. But wait, there's another twist. If Allison was friends with her on-screen enemy, how close was she with others? And as that turns out, where the real tension came from is where you'd least expect it. America's pa, Michael Landon. And we also have an entire video dedicated to Landon's short and troubled life if you want to watch that one next. But for now, just know that Allison has called Landon a bundle of contradictions, very capable of being a fun-loving uncle figure and an absolute terror to all around him. Landon drank a lot, even right on set. Allison saw Landon drinking away in the back of a prop truck and saw a staff member pour four fingers of wild turkey bourbon into his coffee. She later had the nasty realization that Landon could clear two cases of Coors beer per day. Allison did say nobody ever looked tipsy on set, but that Landon could get volatile. One time, Allison broke her arm in a skateboarding accident. She ended up in a cast, and since it interfered with filming, Landon set the ultimatum. No more skating. He also signed the cast in big letters in a place impossible to miss, so she didn't forget while recovering. Allison saw enough of Landon's unsavory side that when Karen Grassley, the mom, released a memoir spilling all the beans about Pa, she backed all the claims. Allison called him, quote, more mad, bad, and dangerous to know. Why did Nasty Nelly leave Little House on the Prairie? For all the challenges playing Nasty Nelly gave Allison, it was pretty great too. She gained a lifelong friend with Melissa Gilbert, and on top of that, Nellie let Allison vent out some of her deep-seated frustrations. You see, as a child, she had been sexually abused. One particular Little House scene had her screaming and raising her fists. Allison looked back and realized, quote, Yep, I was very relaxed after that day. Nellie was also full of some pleasant surprises for Allison. She became the subject of a pretty interesting character arc transforming her bratty personality into something more mature and likable. And there was the problem. Allison called Nellie bland and boring after she reformed, and the writers couldn't think of anything else to do with the character. That meant Allison too had nothing to do, and in her memoir, she admitted feeling a total lack of excitement. The idea of doing that into her 30s left Allison sick to her stomach. So the paycheck had to be big enough, or so she hoped but NBC did not budge. The network refused every bit of negotiation. Their terms, four years, same pay and conditions, take it or leave it. Losing a job is shattering enough, but for Allison, the blow stung especially hard because she was very loyal to the show. Her agent and dad were outraged on her behalf, but the final choice was hers. Allison Arngrim walked away from Little House. There was no grand goodbye, leaving Allison feeling a bit unfulfilled but leave it to Melissa Gilbert to make her feel special. Allison reached out to her and Gilbert already knew. She was a rock and got her an unusual gift. Gilbert gave Allison a necklace with a crying baby charm, saying that it reminded her of Allison. And the gift was wrapped in a jobs listing from the local paper. Gilbert added, quote, you probably will need these now. Touche half pint. What does Allison Arngrim do now? Even though Allison was the face of a bratty mean girl, she had no trouble landing future work. Her little house heritage is one she can celebrate, despite the rough ending. And you have to read her memoir called Confessions of a Prairie <laughs> Great title, Allison, but it's the nostalgic crossover of the century in the web series, Life Interrupted. There you can see Allison playing the life partner of another Do You Remember favorite, little Aaron Murphy from Bewitched. 
The two actors had a blast working together, and it's given Allison's husband plenty of material to tease her with, jokingly bonding with Aaron over having both married Allison. But Nellie's biggest joy is her advocacy work. In between jobs, Allison really felt the depression from her childhood abuse. After a lot of therapy, she dedicated herself to helping others. She has served as president of the National Association to Protect Children. She had a lot of influence, speaking to the California State Senate, campaigning in multiple states, and influencing federal legislation. When her on-screen partner, Steve Tracy, came forward with his HIV diagnosis, yup, she signed up for the AIDS Project Los Angeles Hotline training program. She read up on all the facts and myths, and used her fame and platform to teach others. Now she can look back and happily say, quote, I get recognized more now than I did when the show was running. There was a time in my 20s when I would say I didn't want to be recognized as Nelly forever. But Nelly was a lot of fun to play. Indeed, I thought I'd be sick of it, but now it just makes me smile. Was David Cassidy's voice altered on The Partridge Family? The Partridge Family took the country by storm in the 1970s, but singing talent wasn't a requirement for joining the cast only two of the main cast could play their respective instruments. That means music runs in the family, and what a mixed, blended family Cassidy would have. David's parents were actors who traveled a lot, so he lived with his maternal grandparents more than with his folks. He was so out of the loop, he found out through a neighbor that his parents had divorced. Don't worry, it was just two entire years after the fact. Oh wow. That set things up for his dad to marry Miss Shirley Jones, and this new acting power couple would have three additional kids. Sean, Patrick, and Ryan. David's famous father also set his son up with his very first manager, getting Cassidy on stage, and it was Broadway no less. A musical called The Fig Leaves Are Falling. The program only lasted for four shows, but a casting director saw David and wanted to work with him more. First came guest spots on TV shows like Marcus Welby MD, Bonanza, and Adam 12. Then he put his musical talents to good use with successful singles like Cherish. Thanks to his background, David and Shirley Jones were the only Partridge cast members to appear in musical recordings. Though David didn't know his stepmom was hired as the lead until after he was cast as Keith. How much was David Cassidy worth at the time of his death? The Partridge family was a gold mine for merchandising. Records, lunch boxes, shirts, David even had a collection of themed goodies but the cast salaries didn't reflect these magnificent profits. It got so bad, Danny Bonaducci, who only made 400 bucks an episode, sometimes lived in the backseat of his car. Even David, who made the most of anyone, was capped off at 600 bucks an episode. Women paid to join the official David Cassidy fan club, and Cassidy saw none of those funds. This didn't sit well with David, who knew how much he brought to the show. So, in retaliation, David stole a whopping $25,000 worth of guitars and equipment from the set. But the wound would still sting well into adulthood. His original contract, signed when he was still technically a minor, said he was supposed to get 15% of revenues from all merch that used his likeness in any way. But he only got five grand total. David publicly warned them in 2011, saying, quote, you owe me a fortune. You want to go to trial? Big bad Sony against David Cassidy? Go ahead. At first, it was widely believed his net worth was 150 grand. In actuality, his value reached 1.68 million. His stolen salary already set David back financially, and it only got worse into adulthood, as his substance abuse would see David go flat out broke at some points. But this wasn't even the worst part of his addiction. Did Sean Cassidy and David Cassidy have the same mother? Through his stepmom, Shirley Jones, David joined a bigger famous family that would include half-brothers Sean, Patrick, and Ryan. Sean, of course, became an actor and singer too, and loved working with David. From an old movie with Marilyn Monroe. In fact, he remembered their Broadway show, Blood Brothers, with tons of fondness, calling it, quote, 
Very cathartic because we both felt connected to our dad. He also said of David, quote, I loved and adored him and he was as funny a guy as you'll ever meet. As kids, the two would have elaborate pillow fights. Then David would jump off his top bunk and Sean would try and catch him. He never did. Brotherhood also gave Sean a front row seat to when David struggled thanks to his incredible fame and the substance abuse David felt as a result. That part of family bonding, Sean would call, quote, so painful and nobody really has the right rule book on how to manage it. Today, Sean is 64 years old. He has outlived his half-brother. What was the tragedy of David Cassidy? The Partridge family brought the whole cast international fame, but especially for David Cassidy. David was confronted by literal mobs of fans everywhere he went. He'd go home and find naked women in his house or car. Among those pining for him was Susan Day, though of course she never took it those lengths. Instead, she quietly pined from afar until they gave romance a quick try. Very soon into this new life, David had an idea to soil his pure image. In 1972, he did an interview with Rolling Stone, where in it he talked all about drugs and even sex. But if the magazine's audience didn't flip through the inner pages, they still couldn't miss the nude photo shoot he did for the cover. Fame just made David feel more lonely and he turned to drinking to feel better. Getting candid about his alcoholism, David said he drank, quote, to cover up the sadness and the emptiness. I never sought the fame and I was always trying to hide from it. The work too was exhausting and David admitted, quote, I was burned out from working 18 hours a day, seven days a week for five years. He lost a formative part of his life, saying, quote, I was doing a television series in the day. I was recording at night and on weekends I was touring. With a work schedule like that, there was no time for life at all. Sometimes his drinking escalated to trouble with the law. After a DUI accident, David was ordered to rehab. He called that arrest experience humiliating. This went on for years and for a time, fans were relieved to hear David got sober. Only problem was, that never happened. He once said that if he were to consume just one more drop of alcohol, he'd be ruined. And it did just that. Late in life, when he was supposed to be sober, David admitted, quote, The fact is that I lied about my drinking. It never stopped. David called it a slippery slope that he fell down, one that had no chance of being conquered. Why did David Cassidy leave his daughter out of his will? David's first child was also the one he was least involved with, Katie. The two were so uninvolved that his will actually stated, quote, any references to child or children are only to Bo and not to Katie. It is my specific intent not to provide any benefits hereunder to Catherine. Okay, so what the heck? David would explain the nature of their relationship saying, quote, I wasn't her father. I was her biological father, but I didn't raise her. Instead, Katie was raised by her mom, Sherry Williams, and her stepdad. So did this have any lasting impact on her? David drafted his will in 2004 and never changed it. It's reported that compared to these days, Katie had much less steady work. It's possible David didn't want to think he was financially supporting a kid who was just going to ride his fame and an estranged one on top of that. But that doesn't quite fit with David's attitude towards Katie. It's said that whatever gap existed for most of Katie's life, the two closed the distance before David passed, but unfortunately, his will stayed the same. What did Shirley Jones say about David Cassidy's death? David Cassidy revealed that he was diagnosed with dementia at 67, but David then admitted it was really alcohol poisoning because of course he never really got sober. Watching David deteriorate and self-destruct, Shirley Jones would admit, quote, we are just scared to death that we are going to wake up one morning and find out that he is dead on the floor. Not long after this heartbreaking news, David's organs rapidly began to fail. With David hospitalized, his family was told he'd need a new liver to survive. 
but there was also no way he'd survive the transplant. And so, they took David Cassidy off life support, and on November 21st, 2017, the former teen idol died. Thankfully surrounded by loved ones, his daughter Katie, estranged and newly reconciled, said his last words were, quote, So much wasted time. David Cassidy was like a natural phenomenon, just the right combination of gifts at just the right time. The one who earned a bigger fan club than the Beatles. But he didn't want a second of it and made the most heartbreaking choices to escape it. And even though it haunted him to his very last day, David used his own pain to teach others and make just a bit of good from what happened to him. Early Life our good old boy David was born in Abilene, Texas on October 4th, 1961. This isn't exactly close to the gilded life of sunny Hollywood, but he had a big inspiration right at home. You see, David is the son of actor Paul Harper. If that sounds familiar, Tennessee native Paul was a film actor who starred in Knight Rider and Run Angel Run but most famously is probably his appearance in 1969's The Wild Bunch, pretty much the quintessential one last job heist movie. In The Wild Bunch, Paul played the character Ross, and he's a familiar face in a lot of programs that take place out west. Some favorites like Bonanza and The Waltons. And sadly, Paul Harper died several years ago, and it was David who acted as caretaker to him. Thanks, Daddy. Good luck, son. A Christmas Miracle It's not uncommon for actors to require some, or heck, even a lot of time finding their footing. The incredible Alan Rickman was 42 when he blasted his way into the limelight with Die Hard. And that iconic voice of Morgan Freeman wasn't mainstream until he was 50 with Street Smart. I will show you the Street Smart. But David didn't have to wait for his big break, since The Waltons is the first thing on his resume. Well, almost. First, he landed the role of Jim Bob in The Homecoming A Christmas Story. Didn't even have Waltons in the name, but that's how the show got its start, and that's how David got his. The Homecoming aired on December 19th, 1971, competing against pretty stiff odds. But to everyone's shock, it was very well received, and it was enough for CBS to order a full series follow-up. With this big extension, David was recruited to reprise his role, and he wasn't the only one. All the child actors and Grandma Ellen Corby stayed the same, but the actors for Olivia Walton and Grandpa Zeb were different. Sticking to Walton's Mountain David has gone by a few names in his life and career, but he's gone by Jim Bob the most. It started in 1971 with The Homecoming and immediately followed that same year with The Waltons. That legendary show ended in 1981, but that was not the end of David's Jim Bob. First, we got the TV movie A Wedding on Walton's Mountain. And that same year, we see Jim Bob again for A Day for Thanks on Walton's Mountain. The middle 90s were jam-packed with special Walton reunions, namely a Walton Thanksgiving reunion, a Walton wedding, and Walton Easter, all of which David was Jim Bob. In fact, eight items in his filmography of 12 projects are Walton related. The childhood on the Waltons was great because having a movie studio as a playground is like the ultimate fantasy. Based on a true story. The Waltons is rooted pretty heavily in reality, which is always more remarkable than fiction. It all began with the 1961 book Spencer's Mountain by Earl Hamner Jr., who played a huge role in creating the show. Hamner was one of eight kids and went on to have a few kids of his own, so big families are a common thread of his stories. One of Earl's siblings was named James Hamner. This is the very real person who provided the inspiration for James Robert, aka Jim Bob Walton. That's thanks to the fact that James was the youngest of that eight sibling bunch. Earl, of course, is personified on screen as John Boy. The real James lived in his childhood home almost all of his life. David's portrayal made the humble man a local celebrity, aided by him living in the house that started it all. James served in the army, worked as a bank manager, then a systems analyst, and retired in 2000. 
Sadly, he only got to enjoy four years of quiet life before passing in 2004. Rest in peace, original Jim Bob. What's it feel like when you watch the show? I gotta tell you, most of the time we sit around and cry. Is it that bad? No, David, it's that good. Two of a kind. Even in a big family, Jim Bob Walton stood out for that infectious enthusiasm for everything. Except paying attention, but hey, he had to focus on what interested him. That came mostly from David Harper himself, who said once he played Jim Bob as himself. He could and did play music just like his on-screen persona. Not all their hobbies quite line up, but the spirit of hands-on doing things is definitely consistent between the both. I think I broke my knuckles on your dumb chin. Like David's love of jigsaw puzzles. I can't really see Jim Bob sitting down to do much of those, but they did both keep busy with their hands. And isn't car restoration just a big metal jigsaw puzzle, right? Both of them also daydreamed. Though Jim Bob daydreamed about the future, while David thought about the past. The former actor is a certified American Civil War history enthusiast. As for their shared love of music, David is more of a Led Zeppelin guy, and with amps a thing, he would play as loud as possible. But the duo shared another big similarity too. After Jim Bob is nearly crushed by a car he's working on, he thinks about becoming a minister. David is on the record saying, quote, My passion is my relationship with my heavenly father. Life off Walton's Mountain. Anyone who lands a longtime TV job knows that their career may always be relegated to that one job. The Waltons is certainly the majority of David's work, but it's not everything. Some other noteworthy titles include The Blue and the Gray, 315, and Fletch, starring Chevy Chase. Can I borrow your towel for a sec? My car just hit a water bump. As of 2011, David Harper is retired from acting, ending a career of exactly 40 years. So where is he now? Well, David ended up getting himself an education studying business. Once he was ready to find work outside of acting, his TV brother Eric Scott reached a dry spell in his career too. Eric ended up managing a big shot California parcel delivery service. So what do you do when your TV sibling needs a job? You hook him up of course. So the high flying Jim Bob now became a truck driver. So, even the least Walton-related job he could get was also through the Waltons. David Harper Today Private but public, on demand, pretty much sums up David's life. If this video inspires you to look more into David Harper, be advised. There is an art dealer with the same name, and our Jim Bob has had to clarify in the past, nope, that's not him. Although he does appreciate artwork, so maybe he'll take that up in the future. And although not art, David is writing. David hopes to get his done within the next few years, so keep an eye out. But in general, David is all about his privacy saying he is open to acting again, but it's not at the top of the list. That spot belongs to visiting Germany and mastering the German language. But he is still in touch with his Walton siblings, and he does enjoy the events related to the show. David says, quote, Looking back, I realize we grew up surrounded by adults, but I am pleased to have been on the show. When we weren't doing anything, we would get in there and be in our own little world. All right, that's enough of me. Now we need to hear from you all. Who was your favorite child star that we mentioned? Who do you think handled the immense fame the best? Did we leave someone out that should have been on this list? Get in the comments and tell us all your thoughts on all these incredibly memorable child stars. If you enjoyed our compilation, please give this video a thumbs up, it really helps. Subscribe to our channel so you never miss a beat. And from all of us here at Do You Remember, we want to thank you very much for watching.